Okay, so thank you for joining us on our fourth webinar in our Essentials of Business Security series. In this video, you have sure. me, uh, I'm Kat from One Password, and I'm talking with Bennett Cyphers from Privacy Badger, a branch of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, so hi, Bennett. Hi, uh, thanks so much for having me on. No problem at all. So we're gonna be talking about uh, blocking extensions today and what businesses can do to safeguard data. So just to get us started, can you introduce yourself a bit and tell us about Privacy Badger for those that might not know? Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, my name is Bennett Cyphers. I've been at the Electronic Frontier Foundation for uh, about a year and a half now. And most of that time I've been working on Privacy Badger, which is a browser extension for Firefox and Chrome. Um, and it's a tracker blocking extension. So the way it works is that it has ways of identifying um, behavior by third-party trackers on the web. Um, these are usually invisible uh, pieces of code that collect data and send it to third parties for the purposes of building behavioral profiles most of the time. So Privacy Badger can identify and then block those trackers uh, as you browse the web. Ah, oh, interesting. Yeah, that was going to be my next question, how, how it actually works. So how, how does it differ from other blocking extensions? So I've seen that uh, there's a couple of others out there that are doing something similar, but what, how is Privacy Badger different? So as far as I know, Privacy Badger is relatively unique in that it learns as you use it. Um, so it's what we call a heuristic blocker rather than a list-based blocker. Um, most blocking extensions, uh, that's Adblock Plus or Ghostery or uBlock Origin, um, have a big list of URLs or domains um, that someone has put together by hand. Someone has gone through and said, or several people have gone through and said, OK, we know all of these different um, URLs are used for tracking. And so every time we see a request to one of those URLs, we're going to block it. Um, what Privacy Badger does is after you install it, it just observes all of the traffic that's leaving your browser. And it says, OK, this URL looks like it's tracking you. This URL also looks like it's tracking you. And um, when it observes the same domain, the same like third party tracking you in three or more different places, it decides, OK, this is a um, significantly common third-party tracker, so we're going to block it from here on out. Um, so it, the advantage of that is that we, as the Electronic Frontier Foundation, don't have to maintain this big list and worry about human error, we're, worry about our decisions being right or wrong on any individual domain. We don't have to worry about new domains or new trackers cropping up that we don't know about because as soon as a new tracker appears in the wild, um, everyone who uses Privacy Badger should be able, their, their extension should be able to identify and block it automatically. Huh, that's pretty neat. Um, so you talked about third party trackers. What, mm -hmm. actually, what actually are third party trackers for, for someone who doesn't work in the privacy, security, or, or even um, online sector? Third-party trackers are um, their companies, businesses, um, actors, I guess, on the web that kind of collect information about you without you knowing about it. Um, some of the biggest ones, the biggest ones are the biggest ad companies. So Google and Facebook are probably the two biggest third-party trackers on the web. Um, so uh, most people are probably aware that when you use Google search or when you're logged into Facebook on Facebook or Instagram, um, those companies are collecting data about you as you use their service. But what you might not know is that um, as you're browsing the rest of the web, if you're on uh, theguardian.com or ESPN.com or some other website that has nothing to do with Google or Facebook, there's most likely an invisible pixel um, or some other kind of like uh, surreptitious tracking code from Google or Facebook that's embedded onto that page that you wouldn't notice as a regular user that is collecting data about your visit to that page and linking it back to your account um, or a profile for you that these third-party companies have. 
Um, and so Google and Facebook are the biggest ones, but there are dozens, hundreds probably of um, quite large third-party tracking networks around the web that collect data about users of websites um, where the websites have nothing to do with the parties that are collecting data about people. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that's, wanna... that's a really good description. Okay. It's a bit scary, really, when you when you think about it, these sort of huge companies and their profiling of us. It is quite extensive. So what would your advice be? What, what can we do about them, um, about third parties? Yeah, I mean, the first thing is installing browser extensions that block these trackers and stopping it at kind of a technical level. Um, another thing you can do is just, uh, so I mean, that's what, that's what Privacy Badger is for. So install Privacy Badger, it'll stop the vast majority of this kind of tracking. Um, another thing that unfortunately happens sometimes uh, is publishers, so these, these trackers are usually tied to advertisements. Um, and so if you go to certain websites, like um, I think the Washington Post is one of them, the Atlantic is one of them, if you visit a website and you're using a tracker blocker that is programmed to block um, tracking behavior, uh, it will also block code and requests that are used for advertising and um, websites will have ad blocker blockers installed that try and identify when someone is using some kind of blocker and they won't let you access the content unless you agree to be tracked. Um, and we think this is a real problem because it's entirely possible to serve ads online without tracking people. And um, what we're trying to do is convince as many publications as possible that they don't need to subject their readers to tracking by these third parties in order to make ad money. Um, so if you, if you run into one of those messages while you're browsing the web using a tracker blocker, um, you should just send a polite email to the website administrators saying, hey, you know, like, I'm trying to block trackers. I'm not trying to block ads. Or I'm not trying to, like, stifle your revenue. I just want to protect my privacy. So please consider using a more privacy protective um, way of making money. It certainly sort of stands with the advertisers and, uh, and that's where the change is going to have to come from by the sounds of things. Mm -hmm. But um, I mean, what, what else do you think would need to change for advertisers to, to start doing the right thing? Do you think it, if, people, if people kind of ask them for it, that would be enough? Or? Um, I, think, I think popular awareness is probably the first step towards a lot of different things. But I think in the end, some kind of strong laws that really protect people's privacy by default. I think GDPR is probably a step in the right direction. I'm not, I think there are some problems with GDPR as well, but it's generally uh, pushing the law towards a place where um, it's not okay for companies to just collect information about people without them knowing and use it however they want. Um, and I think we're, we're still kind of yet to see how GDPR can actually be applied to these, these trackers. Um, there, there are some, there's some good work by uh, some folks at Brave. Brave is a browser that tries to like protect privacy by default and um, they've filed complaints uh, with um, a couple of data protection agencies against the International Advertising Bureau or board, I think, which is the standards body that uh, kind of dictates how all these trackers actually work. Um, and it's an organization that most people have never heard of because most people never interact with it um, or not that they know of. So there's some, there's, I think there's gonna be a, a, a legal component to it as well. Um, but really, it's the kind of thing where if you just shine sunlight on it, it, it sort of has to dissolve because it only works at such a large scale because the vast majority of people who are using the web have no idea that it's happening. That's the scary thing, isn't it? I mean, mm -hmm. certainly when you talk about um, bigger companies like Brave, for example, getting involved and, and they've obviously got a bigger voice there. What would you suggest that we can do as individuals to get our message heard to corporations that we want our data to be protected or to be used differently? Hmm. Um, I mean, the easiest thing is to make privacy positive choices in your own life. 
For example, um, switching from Chrome to Firefox or to Brave or another browser that sort of gives you better privacy protections by default. Um, trying to use services, I, I know it's, it's kind of impossible to escape um, Google and Facebook completely, but in places where you can choose to use services that are a little more privacy protective, uh, do that, like maybe use DuckDuckGo as your default search engine if you can. Um, use, use a tracker blocker. Um, and yeah, and if you, if you feel so inclined, just kind of reach out to publishers that you care about and say, hey, maybe you, know, you don't have to track all the people who read your content. Like, I like your site. I want to support you, but I really don't want to um, have to sacrifice my privacy to do so. Um, if you're if you're feeling even more active, you might want to reach out to your local politicians and say, "Hey, this is an issue that I care about. Um, privacy online matters, and um, I hope you can do more to protect it." Um, but yeah, I'd say I'd say the most important thing is just kind of uh, voting with your feet, voting with the products that you choose to use. Yeah, absolutely. Those are some really good suggestions. Um, well, you kind of you've made a very good case for um, everyone using a blocking extension. Um, what, what would you say are the risks for those that don't? Um, so it's a little hard to, well, unfortunately, the risks are kind of unevenly distributed. Um, there's sort of, with, with, the, with third party tracking, there's not a huge risk to most people, but there is a lot of risk to some people. Um, because what happens is data, data is collected by the big companies, by um, and by data brokers. These are companies that only exist to collect data and then sell it to other companies. Um, and these data brokers can use browsing activity that they observe to build profiles of people. Um, they, can, they can assemble kind of like shadow credit reports and be like, oh, this person is likely to have this kind of income and to be this kind of lender. Um, they can try and interpret things about healthcare data um, about which people have what kind of diseases. Um, and then they can sell lists that include, that are based on that data to whoever wants to buy them. And so downstream, you can have some kind of shady actor saying like, oh, I'd like to buy a list of everyone who's likely to think they have cancer or people who are likely to be like uh, high risk lenders. Um, and target them with potentially really harmful messaging. Um, and it can also be used, it uh, is frequently used to target vulnerable people for payday loans, um, to target people for discriminatory housing or employment ads, um, all kinds of things. And uh, this, this all kind of happens in the shadows and it's very hard to regulate it because um, as as one of these like kind of shady ad targeters, you can target only a very small group of people who are likely to be susceptible to your message without kind of um, bombarding the wider public or maybe even without making your ads or the messages you're targeting people with available to regulators or the people who would be policing this kind of thing. Um, so yeah, it's, there, there the, there's the risk of privacy harm, there's the risk of data breach, um, but there's also the risk of just vulnerable people being targeted with uh, deceptive, creepy, um, or manipulative ads. Yeah, I think that you've just put it so well. So thank you for that really good explanation. Um, it really does come, come down to people understanding what the power of their data can do um, and educating people in that because... I, I mean, I even I know people who would say, oh, I've got nothing to hide, you know, I'm just a normal mm -hmm. person. And, and people don't, don't really get it. They don't understand what, um, what their data, how their powerful the data can be in the hands of the wrong person. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, I guess, yeah, as you said, ed educating people to, to understanding the value of their knowledge, the value of the data. Um, is a really great start. Do you think? Do you think that would fix our privacy problems? Um, educating people? No, that won't fix it on its own. But it's it's a step in the right direction. I mean, I think both you and I live in in societies where people can um, affect real change. Fortunately, I think, 
and it, it just takes some momentum. It just takes bringing this kind of thing out of the shadows, saying like, all right, let's have a real referendum. Like now that everyone knows what's going on, let's, let's talk about how we actually want our society and our internet to look. And is this really the way we want things to work? And I think if enough people are educated and enough people understand um, the way things really work, they'll say, you know what? I don't like this. I think we should make a change. I think um, we should have control of our data and we shouldn't let these third parties follow us wherever we're going and <laughs> uh, profile everything we're doing. Wow, awesome. So we noticed that you have a surveillance self-defense online kit. Mm -hmm. um, so aside from using the privacy badger extension, is there anything else that you would recommend to individuals or businesses to help safeguard their data? I mean, the big thing is making sure you're using HTTPS as much as possible. So I, I've been talking about kind of one type of surveillance, which is uh, third party, mostly corporate tracking online. Um, but there are also, there's also uh, your ISPs can track what you're doing um, in much greater detail if you're not using HTTPS. Um, if you're not using encrypted, uh, in, if you're not using HTTPS for encryption on the web, or if you're not using um, an encrypted chat app like Signal or like WhatsApp, um, then your chat logs are visible to governments and companies who serve them. And so it's important to, um, I mean, depending depending on your threat model, depending on what you're worried about happening, you you might want to make sure that. You're using encrypted uh, messaging services as much as possible. Um, if you do end up in a country where the government is not so friendly to free speech, or you're trying to access resources that might actually put you in danger um, because of your government or because uh, you're being targeted by um, certain powerful actors, you might want to consider using Tor or another kind of anonymizing service, which allows you to browse the web um, more or less anonymously. There's some caveats to that, but you can, you can read more about it in our guide. Um, yeah, so there's, we, we have a lot of really good resources put together by some really great people who aren't me um, that just talk about the different kinds of things that you might be worried about and how to mitigate those risks online. Awesome, well that's, yeah, you've already given us some really good advice and uh then we can be sure to uh, take a look at the surveillance self-defense online kit as well. So, um, yeah, wicked. thanks for that. I think that's everything uh, we wanted to cover today. So thanks so much for joining us, Bennett. Yeah, thanks so much for having me.